and welcome. Yes, a very good morning, everyone. Hello and welcome to The Other Perspective, a space where we interrogate the thing behind the thing that is the thing. Um, let me request you to press the like button down below, share if you can, and if you haven't subscribed yet, please do so. So today we discuss fraud in local governments. Who is responsible for this mess? Um, let me give you some context to this topic. Um, Uganda's state minister in charge of economic monitoring, Honorable Peter Ogwang, is conducting a countrywide oversight monitoring exercise to establish the efficacy of central and local government programs, projects, and policies. These were implemented with a view of triggering economic transformation that the NRM government has been promising the people of Uganda. In 2008, Uganda was estimated to be losing 500 billion to corruption. Um, as we can see on the screen, over 500 million was allocated for the construction of these district chambers, but we can see <laughs> the image doesn't show the 500 million. Um, we also see 76 million was allocated to complete the concrete decking of this TCTC bridge, but we can see the quality of that bridge doesn't match 76 million. And to date, recently, the IGG announced that in only the year 2021, Uganda lost 10 trillion to corruption. Um, during the tour, the minister has unearthed corruption on a scale and magnitude that the country may perhaps not have known had it not been for the works of this fisherman. Um, on the screen, we can see 1.3 billion was allocated for the construction of Bubita Seed School, but this is the state of the school lately. You can see the floor. It doesn't translate to the 1.3 billion. So with me to find answers to these and more questions is the usual panel of three Ugandan panelists to begin with. Ms. Priska Wanyenya. Priska is an activist and a journalist covering Parliament of Uganda, and she's also a regular panelist. Priska, you're most welcome to the show. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> yes, and second, we have Mr. Eddie Kainda, who is an economist and also an educationist. Eddie, you're very welcome to the show. Thank you, Elizabeth. You're most welcome. Yeah, and lastly, we have Mr. Henry Muguzi, who is a pan-Africanist, a pro-democracy activist and civil society leader. Henry, you're most welcome to the show. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, an honor and a pleasure for me to be here. All right, All right so let's get straight to the questions. Um, Henry, I'm going to begin, begin with you. From where you stand, can you help our viewers understand the scale and magnitude of corruption in, in local governments? Thank you very much, Lisa. And uh, I think uh, for me to be able to uh, describe what I see from where I stand, it's important that I give our viewers the genealogy of, uh, of this mess in local governments. You will understand in 2003, uh, government of Uganda enacted a legislation called Public Procurement and Disposal of Public Assets Authority Act, which established the Public Procurement and Disposal of Public Assets Authority. Regulations were done in, uh, uh, instantly. And so one of the things we see uh, with the creation of the act was that uh, the central uh, uh, the central purchasing board previously all the procurements in Uganda were being handled in one center it's called it was called central purchasing so it was you know that's where all the thieves had convened and gathered and gotten plots and were were, were staying so with the creation enactment of the PPDA act uh, the local governments uh, 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 potentially became procurement and disposing entities and therefore the law gave them powers to set up procurement committees and the function of procurement was decentralized but little did the government of uganda know that by decentralizing the function of procurement they were also decentralizing corruption 
And therefore, the corruption which hitherto had been uh, 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 concentrated in one place was now scattered. It would scatter to all local, all local governments. Fast forward to where we are now. I think we need to applaud the good efforts of this fisherman, Honorable uh, 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 Peter Ogwang, for going around and exposing and uh, for public scrutiny the mess that none of us had imagined. It appears that for the longest time, all the funds that the government has been funding and channeling and pushing into local governments have been landing in the hands, the wrong hands of greedy, thieving officers that have connived and looted these local governments at the detriment of the ordinary person. So um, um, from where I stand, it's that local governments are infested with the cabals of thieves that have made sure that the ordinary Ugandan on the ground is deprived and denied of his rights to quality social services. And I think we need to applaud the, 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 the good honorable minister, excuse me, but also we need to, 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 to hold accountable those that seem to have gone to, 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 to bed, to sleep. Back to you, Lisa. Lisa, me, I don't hear you. I, th I don't know whether you are muted. I'm also not hearing her. You can hear me now? Yes. Yes, I can. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Henry, for your submission. So I'll move to you, Priska. From where I stand, can you help our viewers understand the scale and magnitude of corruption? In local governments. Thank you, Lisa, and for hosting us again on the show. And I, I usually give my perspective as a journalist. So recently, Parliament was scrutinizing another supplementary of about 3.8 trillion, and in one of the items was the office of the president. I think we lost Priska. Um, I think Priska is having difficulty with her connection. So I'll move to you, Eddie, from where you stand. Can you kindly help our viewers understand the scale and magnitude of corruption in local governments as an educationist and economist? Uh, thank you, Lisa. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me to this discussion. Uh, for a viewer to understand the scale of corruption uh, in local governments, we need to first understand uh, how did we come to decentralize? You know, Uganda uh, decentralized and we do have a decentralization policy that takes uh, uh, administration management of social services down to the grassroots and down to the local governments. But also we have the Local Government Act that uh, spells out how monies uh, that go to these local governments must be used, must be administered. But most importantly, uh, for us to understand that 70% uh, of these monies that go to these local governments are expended through procure a procurement system, a system that is supposed to ensure that uh, uh, monies are efficiently used, resources benefit the persons, but also have value for money. But uh, now, what goes wrong? Uh, when we decentralize, we also seemed to decentralize corruption. Uganda has consistently ranked among its one of the highest in East Africa, but also in Africa, as one of the highest, highest co corrupt institutions that we do have in this continent. But also that has gone on to affect the way services are delivered in the local government, including monies that are supposed to help the ordinary person to, to, to uplift himself from poverty, to improve social economic trans transformation, but also to, to ensure that uh, an ordinary person receives the basic social services. Now, <clears throat> and I will tag this to the structure. 
that are when we we have a pyro structure that speaks about the politicians but also the technocrats it seems that like when we say uganda is corrupt there is a tendency of the corrupt politicians but also aligning up with the corrupt technocrats who steal ugandans when you look at the bumper you have made and uh, the, the the presentation you made at the beginning where was the district engineer when such was happening where was the local government lc5 chairperson when this was happening where was the local government accountability committee when this was happening where was the igg where was the the, the rdcs when this was happening it shows you that the level of corruption has gotten to a level where there is collusion where there is connivance where there is participation and involvement of each and every person that is that is involved in the social service structure to steal from Ugandans and it's no wonder that Uganda has failed to attain the middle class status but also Uganda has declined irrespective of whether covid-19 has been here has declined in the levels of poverty it has declined in the in all the human development indices that we do have including income at household level including education including health so we are in a sorry state and we have to do something to ensure that such kind of scenario is is averted back to you lisa thank you so much eddie so priska i hope your connection is better now can you hear me yes i can yes so um because you're a parliamentary journalist and i believe that you interact a lot with these mps can you explain the absence of these elected leaders whose role among other things is to supervise the utilization of public funds in the delivery of public services um, Priska? Priska, I think Priska is having difficulty with her Yeah, it's, she's having difficulty, but it, as, it, as, as Priska comes in, Eddie mentioned a very important point here. Because I think what we are seeing at the, the images you showed us are just the tip of the iceberg. So what happens potentially in the local governments is that uh, most of the spending is done through procurement for infrastructure. So it could be roads, building schools, it could be uh, construction of health centers and uh, repair, repair or construction of bridges. And all of these fall square under the purview of the district engineer. So what happens here is that the district engineer and most of the districts you find, a district has one engineer who is the, the civil engineer, he's also the auto engineer, but he's also the only technical person that is knowledgeable about things like this. So when it comes to developing uh, BOQs, the, the bills of quantities, it is only him that can actually interpret them. So you find that at all stages of the procurement process, it is that engineer that is involved. He has developed the, 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 the BOQ, but he's also the one who is going to help the evaluation committee to make sense out of the, of, of, of the, of the bids submitted. He's the one advising actually who should be recommended to, uh, as the, the best evaluated bidder. He is also, on the other hand, the one that is conniving. And therefore, for, for anyone to survive in the district, you must be in very good books with the, 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 the district engineer. You will find the cow is under the, 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 the whims and caprices of the district engineer, because this district engineer uh, is the one who determines who takes the, what, the contract. He is also the one who issues the certificates of completion, including for the very, for the shoddiest of works. Now, because the district engineer is so strong and almost untouchable, uh, he finds himself in a situation where even when we elect the, uh, 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 the councillors at, at the local district level, the councillors at the uh, sub-county level, uh, the chairperson of the district, because these have spent a lot of money uh, and they think that uh, being elected there becomes their ticket to Eridora door, the land of gold, therefore they get to connive with the district engineer and technical team to defraud and rob uh, the district. Uh, so this is what happens there. And of course, then it asks me very good questions. 
the people that are supposed to monitor and make sure this does not happen where are they so there are quite a, a number of questions and, and and a few answers but for us as citizens these are worrying times uh citizens are concerned we are concerned that public resources continue to be um uh, uh, uh siphoned we are concerned that the status of the ordinary ugandan at the grassroots level this ordinary person who scorches who who bears the scorching sun to stand out and vote the one who uh, um, uh, is in, impoverished is not able to access the good services the services for which some of us have paid the taxes to make sure that those services are delivered we are really uh, discomforted and uh, and uh, and uh, and annoyed that these things happen mm -hmm. thank you so much Henry, for that Yes, Eddie, you had earlier mentioned um, that you can't see the RDCs do anything with this misconduct at the local government level. It takes ministers, it takes the prime minister to unearth all these cases of corruption. So I would want to ask you, where have been the RDCs who, as we understand, are the eyes and ear of the president? Where have they been in all these scandals? Eddie, you seem to be muted. Eddie, you are muted. We need to understand how the structure of governance works in the Ugandan context. There are, we have systems and procedures that we must follow in ensuring that our persons can get access to services. Before even the RDC comes in place, we have uh, the equivalent of a president in a local government, who is the AC5 chairperson, whose interest is supposed to be the interest of the people because he's voted through adult suffrage. That is one. Two, we have an accounting officer in a local government who is supposed to be the chief administrative officer of this local government that is supposed to oversee the acquisition of the money, the mobilization of the resources, and the transfer of the resources to the persons to benefit in terms of your services, right? We have the, a local government accountability forum or committee that is supposed to ensure that the money that have come does physically the work it's supposed to do, but also accounted for in terms of efficiency, in terms of effectiveness. The role of the RDC comes in at the level where it's supposed to oversee the voice of the presidency. Unfortunately, I have firsthand come across RDCs that actually participate in the sharing of the monies that are supposed to ensure that people get delivery of services. The RDCs are participating in the procurement of these services. The RDCs are involved in uh, 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 development and delivery of uh, uh, bills of quantities for bridges, for schools, for, uh, for infrastructure projects. The RDCs are participating on the table, on the sharing table, to the extent of ensuring that they. They, they, they scramble and partition the resources that have been delivered to the local government at the expense of the of the Wanainchi. So, for me, and this is happening under the eyes of the president. The president is watching. The president has been siphoned out of it, the, the information flow. The eyes of the president have, have been closed by the by these so-called RDCs. The RDCs, RDCs are hungry, they, they are poor, they are political failures. You get, you cannot bring a hungry lion and you give it meat and you think it shall refuse the meat. No, it can't happen. So I, before I came to the mainstream civil society, I, I was involved in, a, in, a, in, in, in tendering, in bidding, in, da, in doing local government work. I'm telling you the things because I have seen let somebody come and ask me where you've seen this, and I'll be able to tell you where it happened, right? One time I was in the office of, 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 of the chief administrative officer with the RDC, with the district engineer, with the pro procurement officer, negotiating, negotiating with me, how much kickback are you going to give us as a result of this project? I won't tell, <laughs> I won't tell you how much, how much it was, but I'm trying to tell you that that so-called RDCs that are in charge and the eyes of the president are also the corrupt, hungry hyenas 
that are feeding on the voter, that are feeding on the citizenry, and the citizens have have got. And I I I am failing the, to get the right words to express this, but the we have still uh, we have stolen from the from the wanaichi, we have stolen from the from the ordinary persons at the expense of these RDCs, and for me they are not doing anything credible. Uh, uh, whereas they are involved so much in security, a, a hungry person cannot benefit from the security as long as he has not had anything to eat. And for me, with due honors, I discredit the, the role of the RDC. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yes, Eddie, you mentioned that the RDCs are hungry, but looking at the RDCs, RDC's salary scale, it's, it's decent enough. Isn't that no, Lisa, Lisa, uh, you shall get to know that most of the RRCs that we do have in Uganda are persons that failed in pro politics. You know what? You know how commercialized Ugandan politics is. Now, uh, I can I can firsthand tell you that these RRCs are failures, and when they're given these positions, they are given positions to use the same positions to get the financial wherewithal to survive. Not that because they have gone to work. No RDC receives more than a million shillings in salary. They are not doing that money. All the money they are getting is in allowances, it's in uh, maybe vehicles, it's in fuel. But they don't they don't get a decent allowance. They have to use the system they are in to ensure that they survive on their own. And if, that is why they have partic effectively participated in stealing from Ugandans. I want I want. I won't, I will use the word steal because I know it has happened and I've seen it happen. Let anybody come and, and say I have not seen. I will even give examples and, and names if needed. Let the president come and ask me who those people are and I will tell them who they are. All right. <laughs> well, thank you, Eddie. <laughs> so, um, Priska, I hope your connection is better now. Can you hear me, Priska? Well, I think Priska is off. So, Henry, I need you to explain if, in your opinion, you think there is a relationship between fraud in local governments and campaign financing at, at that level. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Lisa. That's a very good question. Because uh, in the process of, of observing campaigns, we have noted, not noticed that uh, uh, as a consequence of our politics being highly commercialized, when the candidates at local government level are contesting or when they express interest to stand, you get to see that they get to be targeted by the businessmen who are in the, uh, uh, accustomed to winning contracts at local government level. So every it's, it, it is in the very best interests of every uh, prominent businessman at local government level to make sure that uh, the people that get to be voted to office are his men or, 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 or women. And therefore, they invest massively in the campaigns of these leaders, which is why you will be, not be surprised if you see that you have an LOC 5 chair person elected, duly elected in office, has constituted his district executive committee, which is a cabinet, but also there is a council, and many of these affronting a certain contractor to win uh, 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 a, a public uh, job, I, I mean a public contract. And you wonder, because they are the ones that bankrolled them uh, uh, into political office, then it is their time after being elected to pay back. Therefore, there is a very uh, direct correlation, if you will, uh, or if you like a relationship, between campaign financing, because it is the private sector that finances these men and women that get to be voted into local government offices, and the purpose uh, for which they are uh, supported uh, financially to go through is, is so that when they get there, they are able to, 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 to scratch the backs of these private uh, contractors by ensuring that they get all the contracts. I have learned yeah, that they have no, even uh, 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 introduced a new dynamic. The new dynamic is that, uh, is, is that uh, I think, Priska, you need to mute yourself. Uh, the new dynamic 
is that uh, if I am uh, a contractor in a patch district and I bankroll the LC5 and the, the council in a patch, so it would look suspicious if I go on and win contracts in that very district. And then what they do is to is is, is to, to to what to exchange. So the, the the team in Apache will look for a similar team in another district, and then uh, uh, so that the contractor, the, the 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 private contractors of Apache district would be winning contracts in another district, and then the ones of another district win here. That way, you will not suspect they have they have advanced in these things. So I think that uh, that uh, that uh, there is a direct correlation and what we have to do now eddie earlier on asked a question and eddie thank you for 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 letting us know about the the maneuvers of these so-called rdc's who are supposed to be the chief monitors of government you see the moment you deploy a chief monitor and when he gets on the ground then he joins and if he joins the team of the thugs and then allies and conspires with the very thieves to steal and loot the very resources he's supposed to protect this is uh, absurd uh, but, but, but this, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is uh, not alone ask yourself a question we have voted in office the LOC 5 the district council we have voted in office the sub-county uh, chairperson the sub-county council we also have an mp these elected leaders are supposed to superintend over service delivery. All of this thuggery has been ongoing without any of them mentioning a word. It has taken the efforts of the good fisherman, Honorable Peter Ogwa, to expose these. In my view, all of these should be brought to book. And in fact, for us as citizens, we want to see heads roaring because these actions cannot be tolerated that 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 50 billion 500 million is spent on a structure that could not even get out of the 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 the, the, the foundation level that we have spent money uh, to, to to construct a bridge and all we can see are calvets put there that somebody puts up something that looks like a bridge but the first rain, the smallest rain that comes, washes it away. That someone has been uh, 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 awarded a contract to construct a road, as we saw in 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 in, in uh, one of those districts districts in uh, in Ibusoga. instead of using cement and the tattoo to to, to 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 mix the the aggregate, he's using clay that you just do do use hands to peel off the the road. Where are these people? Where? How would the chief uh, district engineer issue a certificate of completion? Payment gets to be done. The cow accepts to pay, and uh, and they get out with it. Can we? Do the cows want to make us believe that for them, they get to be glued and tied in the offices, that they are not able to go to the field to see the project for which they are about to sign a payment? In which case they should be able to say i am not going to pay for this one because there's no work done this conspiracy that has been going on for the longest time must be checked and this is the time i think ugandans uh, should should rise up this is the time to stop uh, uh protecting and exonerating the things thank you thank you so much henry thank you for that so Priska, I hope your network is now stable. Please unmute. I think you're muted. Yes, yes. All right. So I'm getting you now. Yes. As before you went off previously, I was asking, because you cover parliament, we believe that you interact a lot with these MPs. And can you please explain the absence of these elected leaders, whose role, among others, is to supervise the utilization of public funds in the delivery of public services. Why do you think they are absent? Uh, I'm, I'm quoting a situation recently, I think in November when, when Peter Wang was appearing before the budget committee, he was coming to support the, the supplementary budget of the office of the president. And in one of the items that 
they were requesting for, I think, 500 million for his car to traverse the country. And the MPs were in support of the idea because they said he needs to move. And, and during the break, the, the, the MPs surrounded him, each of them begging for him to go to their constituencies. They, are, they were asking, please come to Kayunga, please come to Kamuli, please come to Kochido. Everyone was surrounding. And the, the, this, this kind of behavior remi reminded me of a study that the former premier, Apollon Sivambi, made some time back. And he said that while he talked about a, a weak central government crushes the local government, and he specifically gave a scenario of the chronology of corruption and he cited an example of during the colonial era when the British tried to, to tell Kabaka Mwanga that you should distinguish between your personal money as a king and that of the treasury as a kingdom. So he thought he was being, he, the, the British were being disrespectful because the Kabaka thought I own the people in Buganda and I own the kingdom. So this, the, the, I, I, I found the, the mere fact that the MPs who were requesting for Oguang to go to their constituencies were on the budget committee and the budget committee is an accountability committee that is supposed to, that is supposed to hold these local governments at check. And they are the ones who are feeling hopeless and in, in that in that same in that same study that that the former premier made, he, he was talking about the effects of of corruption, and it, he says that one of the effects of corruption is it deprives the rulers of their right to rule, because now the MPs are here appearing helpless, asking for a minister to come and rein into the corruption in in their constituencies. Yet they have they have all the constitution and the powers of the high court. They always brag about when they are trying to threaten the witnesses in parliament, but they could, they could not use it. It gives you an, a picture of how deeply rooted and sophisticated the corruption in Uganda has become that right from the top, the president up to the lower person, we, we all feel hopeless. I, I, I tend to think that there they won't be a solution to the corruption. I, I, Sometimes I tend to think we, we should just try to live with it like we are trying to live with COVID. Yes, Priska, but why should we live with it? And yet it's clearly stated in the constitution that their role is to supervise, to oversee the utilization of public funds. Why should we make it a norm and accept that? That is how it's going to be. That they are paid to do that. Lisa, that, that day when the MPs were talking to Oguang, they felt hopeless. You see, they were, they were literally pleading with him. They said, what do we do for you? What should we do for you to come to our constituents and constituencies and you try to do what you're doing in Kayunga and every, every. So they, 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 they made it personal that probably the Oguang had a, had, had a grudge against them that that is why they are not he's not going to their constituencies so that that state of hopelessness from even our electoral leaders does does not give any courage any faith to any hope to the rest of us who mwana inchi as the president calls us i think that is why we have become resentful we resign to the mere fact that we can ever fight against corruption we don't even believe that even if Chagulani was voted as the president of SJ, they would really deal away with the corruption. We, 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 have, we have seen, because those of us who cover parliament, we have seen most of those, the MPs, we, we, the MPs that the opposition, we know that they meet with the president. And one of them has, has, is on record saying that if the president calls you, it's better for you to go and meet him that, than not meeting him. Because if you don't go and meet him on any matter, he's going to crush your business. That is why, that is why you, you tend to question yourself, why have the people like Mafabi sustained themselves in businesses? Their businesses are still strong, but they are opposing, 
the president. They're opposing the government at hand because you would rather go and meet the big man and have your business or, or your income stabilized than staying one in fear that when a report leaks that you met the president at state house, you it will cost you your vote. So that, that, that is how we... For, for someone who has interfaced with, with the corruption, I, I tend to think that we, it's something we have to live with, with in, in, in the near future. Because now, nowadays, even if we are appearing before the accountability committees, we are going to weigh the amount of money that is being investigated. If it is in millions, we know that we are not going to get space or time for broadcast. We, now, we, we as journalists now, we deal in billions in corruption, trillions in corruption. Millions of local governments are hardly talked about. But even, even when you look at the Otter General himself, his office is overwhelmed because he is even supposed to, to audit sub-counties. We, we have over 20, is it 20,000 sub-counties in Uganda? And that, that is the reason that if the accountability committees are also overwhelmed with their with the Auditor General reports in that last in around May, the parliament had to take a decision where they had to adopt reports without scrutinizing them for about five years back because of the backlog. So with, with all this, if, if parliament has all the budget, they, their budget is over 800 billion every year, this year, and they cannot scrutinize these accountability reports. It's just a mere scrutinizing, bring the evidence that the auditor general thinks like that. So what what hope does a lay person have in hoping that the corruption will really be resolved in uganda wow well that leaves me wondering if the, the igg recently said that they are leaving they are calling upon the public to join the fight against corruption but if the mps as you say themselves are helpless what happens to us the ordinary people well thank you priska so Henry, I'm going to bring you in again. Um, what is the role of regional officers of the Inspectorate of Government? We don't see them in this fight. What is their role exactly? Thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, allow me to kind of uh, take it from where Priska just left it. Uh, the point she made is that uh, we actually do not have political leaders. We have political merchants. We have, uh, we have wrongfully or oh, unwittingly uh, elected these uh, thieving men and women uh, into police public office. But when they get there, it is, it is, it, it, it is the uh, mercantilism that matters. That's why you bring out the issue of uh, we must meet the president even when we are in opposition, which, which begs the question, do we even have op political opposition? Let me, on that point, argue that fraud in local governments is, is posing a serious threat to democracy in this country because as you see it is disempowering the district councils it is disempowering the elected members of parliament and therefore if you hear stories such as mps who would have taken up the mantle on their own requesting and and and, and wishing that the honorable fisherman uh, peter ogwang goes to their place and then we then you know we are in trouble but back to your question the inspectorate of government has decentralized offices to the regional level i remember for the longest time the argument for decentralizing these offices was to bring this nearer to the to the to the to the people but also to to enable the inspectorate of government to detect the question is where was these offices? We have men and women who we pay salary every month to make sure that they connect and link with the with the, 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 the ordinary people, you know, pick up evidence and follow up on these and conduct investigations and then bring them to their uh, 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 conclusion. But a situation where a building, a bridge, something that looks like a bridge is put up, in full glare of the communities, uh, a road that does not look like a, a, a road that looks like anything but 
a health center, you know, somebody constructs a floor and, and then the plastering, and I think start peeling off in, in full glare of everybody. And the office of the IGG that has regional offices, that has men and women who earn a salary, that are supposed to be detecting and taking on the thieves, but is unable to do its work until when Ogwanga comes around. I think this is an indictment on that office. Again, like I said, we want to see heads rolling. We don't see why we should continue paying taxes to pay those salaries of those officers who have gone to sleep. The moment they chose to go to sleep, let them continue sleeping. Let them go and let us hire and recruit officers that can be able to detect and help us fight these thieves because you, as you said corruption is so entrenched in the minds in the fabrics of society that to fight it i think we need everybody on board and therefore we don't want people who go to sleep we don't want sleeping sleeping officers like these ones of the IG, office of the ig and the ig owes it to ugandans to come and apologize because for all the money we have spent on those decentralized offices, they have not been able to develop capacity to detect structures that are shoddy, that are put up in full glare of everybody. And they're not able to see, are they blind or are they conniving? I think they have also chosen to join the cabal of thieves. And for this, I think we need to, 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 to hold them to account. Back to you, Lisa. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Henry. So, Eddie, on top of all that Henry has said, despite the regional offices of the IG being present at the districts, we also can't see the anti the police anti-corruption unit. Where where is the police in all this? Uh, Lisa, before I come to your question, there is something I want to put straight. Uh, Henry is aware that I one time engaged in uh, trying to identify and understand how contractors do their work in local governments. And this is what the contractors have to say. Most of the time, they are put at the firing line of doing shoddy work. But uh, uh, you are aware that, uh, given an example, if he's, a contractor is given 100 million shillings of uh, constructing a, a bridge somewhere, like the bridge we saw, uh, the contractor has to pay taxes 18 percent the contractor has to pay withholding tax of six percent over and uh, 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 below the threshold that is supposed to pay as uh, as, uh, as, uh, as the full value contract but also uh he's supposed to uh have a kickback uh of between 10 to 20 percent ideally uh and many other operating costs uh eventually at the time when the contractor is in a contract, he's actually already operating uh, at around 60% of the money he's supposed to have uh, received as, uh, as as money for the full contract. Then at the end of the day, you cannot expect the same contractor to deliver uh, a, a, a good job. What these contractors are not telling us is that uh, they actually, the money that is given to them, uh, the fields follow the money and pick it up from them, including the district engineers, including the chief administrative officers, including the technical persons that are supposed, including the police that you're saying. You cannot contextualize the police in Uganda's governance system. It is uh, consistently, it has been ranked as the most corrupt institution in Uganda for the last 10 years. You can look out for the reports for, from Transparency International, but also look out for the police audits that we have had in Uganda. I had the the, the chief political commissioner mentioning that uh, they're now going to start arresting themselves through the professional standards unit. They, they, they can't do that. That they're also going to start arresting uh, public, I uh, mean, citizens that corrupt them. You know, you, you, you slept hungry and somebody is giving you money and you're arresting the same person. That cannot happen. Police, the, 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 the institution of... Uh, the uncorruption police is a procedural issue, probably because somewhere the donor has given the money to do that. But if whether this happens in practice, 
you and I know that it cannot work. A police officer that you see on the road every day gets about 450,000 shillings per month. This is the same person that has a family, that has a home, that has children that go to school. How do you expect such a police officer to, to stop corruption? When corruption is his bed, it is his uh, lusuku, it is his everything, you know? Police, I really don't want to even include police in this discussion. It is non-existent, it, it cannot happen, and it, wow. it will never happen. I think Eddie is having trouble with his connection. I can you, hear you very well. No, me, I can um, hear him. Well, I'm I, to come to you. Yes, um, yes. Eddie raises some interesting thoughts there. But I think it goes beyond being hungry. I think it's a matter of morality and more of that. I think the whole country has just degenerated and people have no morals anymore. So Priska, um, the IGG Honorable Betty Kamia recently called for a lifestyle audit of civil servants. Do you think this can be a game changer? Lifestyle audits have been done in Kenya and several other countries that I can't mention now. But do you think this method can be a game changer in ending corruption? Th th thank you, Lisa. The, 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 time, the time at which the IGG made that proposal, the lifestyle audit, she had, a few weeks back, she had met the speaker and had admitted that right now her office is idle because she doesn't have funds to investigate corruption cases because one of the biggest funders, that is DGF, that was funding the IGG's office with about 70% of its budget had cut off funding. So she literally said she was idle. So if, we, if I whistleblow about, about Henry's lifestyle being over what he gets. What is she going to do? She doesn't have funds to investigate in the first place. And I'm reacting to Eddie's statement where I'm not, not, to, not to question his expertise in investigation on the, on the corruption in local government, but he hinted on something about the taxes that the contractors have to pay. And he talked about the 18% VAT and the withholding, but the, the little knowledge I know about procurement is these contracts are made in a way that there is that component of VAT exclusive or VAT inclusive. So I, I thought the contractors have to work around that to make sure that your contract has to cater for that provision. Now I would I would like to seek clarification on that on that point. So, but, but back to your question on the IDG, we. we why, why, why we tend to think that the corruption moved a long time away from the public sector now to the private? We know we have made it personal. Each time somebody is accused of being corrupt, the people who are benefiting, who are dependents, come out and usually say, "But this one stole this. How comes it is out?" And we, we, we. we out moving freely and you, you're going after my, my person. Like we, 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 we tend to, to, to put a certain degree of corruption. And when it comes, when we, we, we scream about corruption, but when it comes closer and knocks on our doors and probably a husband or a wife or a sister, a, a brother, we, that is when we, we lose it all and we, 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 we deal with things like is being witch hunted, witch hunted by work or they are envious. And so th that is how deeply rooted corruption is. And I tend to think we as a country, we are not serious about fighting corruption. We are going to talk about it, scream, but until it gets close at your door and knocks, con, 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 that is and for the case of, as, as Ed had said, he, he, he doesn't even want to bring police. And I, I tend to back him into this argument. We have seen cases where police exhibits have disappeared from the stores. You, you remember the case where one of the horses was taken to court because he, he got an a car exhibit and sold it to the wife at around 1 a.m a card, one M, and it was in good condition. 
So I'm, I'm really supporting Eddie when he says that it won't even to bring police into this discussion because for its case, it is too much. When it comes to corruption, they are top there. When it comes to torture, human rights report, they are always top there. It's like they, they, there is a comp I, I tend to think there is a competition within the police force. They want to outdo each other when it comes to human rights abuse. They, they, are, they, they are really protective of their top spot. So when Eddie says he doesn't want police to, to come into discussion, it's really too much when it comes to that institution. All right. Um, Chris Pat, so you had earlier said that DGF, that's one of the founders of the IG, is still mm. closed till now. And the IG just said that she's idle. So is there a hope for this fight if the institution that's meant to fight corruption is not functioning at the moment? What happens? Well, is this a fight that we need to give up on? If even the police that's supposed to complement the IG's efforts is the top most corrupt institution in the country, what happens then on? When, 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 when Kamya made that statement, I went... I went and looked at the budget of the IGG, and in in the that that year, I think this current financial year, they had gotten about fifty three billion, and about seventy percent was going on to the wages. And when I, I looked into deeper into the their their budget, I I, th I I realized that they had allocated about three billion for corruption-related investigations. So does that tell you something? And when, when, I was, when, you, when you sent me the, the topic about, I also look, looked also on the, the, the local governments, the, the, or the Auditor General's report, when the one he released in, in, in this year, and the, the money that was released to all local governments was around 4.1 trillion released by the Minister of Finance. And 3.9 of it was spent on employee costs. And only 1 trillion was spent on service delivery. So does, does that give you a picture of this issue of service delivery, local governments, if you're, you're being given four trillion and three trillion is going on employee costs, salaries and everything, only one trillion is going to, to service delivery. That is why um, when people bring up this new, new item they are talking around of the parish model, they, they are thinking that finally, the people who are the, some economists in, in the civil society, they think that finally the parish model is going to bring services closer to the people. But me, when I look at these releases vis-a-vis -vis what, what is being spent on the real service delivery, I really have my doubts and I need hard convincing that the, the, the service delivery is going to improve even with, with all this corruption and now you brought in the new animal, the parish model. Wow. Thank you, Priska, for enlightening us, especially with those budgets. That clearly shows us that there's no political will in, in fighting this. Um, Lisa, so Lisa, I wanted to, uh, to, to deliver something before uh, your network got bad. Yes, I, I want us to go back to the statistics. Uh, Yesterday, when I was, uh, we, we, we need to give corruption a face. I want to agree with, uh, with a lady that uh, until people get to know what corruption is, probably we may not have to take the fight toward, uh, against corruption further. Yesterday, when I was leaving work around Chiseka Market, uh, I found a man, uh, uh, three men seated uh, uh, on a border border, uh, the border border rider and the person at the back. But... Uh, Inside, uh, between them was a dead man. Somebody was transporting a dead body on a border border. I think from a facility somewhere. I felt like helping, but if it were not for COVID, uh, I would have helped that person. But uh, I would imagine that this person could have died because of a bad health uh, system somewhere. 
but also because uh, of a non-functional health system, uh, you cannot carry a dead, a dead body on a border border. It shows you the level of decay of, of a system. But we're also talking about uh, uh, a statistic where eight point uh, three point uh, I mean eight point three uh, million Ugandans ha have vulnerability to poverty, but also about four uh, three point five are chronically out of the money economy and they are on a verge of losing their dignity for life. And uh, thirdly, we are looking at a situation where Ugandans cannot give corruption a face through seeing people die, for example, through people uh, lacking food in their houses, through people not accessing a good health system, through people not uh, accessing the COVID stimulus packages, through closure of the civil society organization, through bad bridges. These are faces of corruption. Until people try to think that corruption has come to their doors, that is when they're not going to that is when they're going to wake up and say, I think we must engage in the fight against corruption. Corruption has been given an alien face than that an ordinary person does not understand the ways, the, 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 the path through which corruption enters his life or enters the doors of his house. And, and for me, uh, that points us back to, 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 to the system, from, uh, from, from the central government system, where the money goes into the directorates, where the money goes into the local government, where the money reaches my mother in Chazanga. That whole system is fraud. And uh, unfortunately, it is, it, is, it is happening under the watchful eye of the, of the president. The president has to take, he has given corruption a lip service. And for me, if we are to stamp out corruption in the, in the local government system, I would want to imagine that Uganda would have a better nation, would be a better state. But apparently the incision of the deeper state into the social service delivery system has killed Ugandans and we, are, we need to have a divine intervention for something better to happen. I thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Eddie. We have a few minutes left to the end of the show and I would love to continue with you, Eddie to just give us a way forward on how we're going to end this. You say the president is merely giving um, lip service, but we do have all these institutions that have been put in place. The president himself um, instituted the anti-state corruption unit and all these other, we have ministers who are going around trying to put an end to this. What else can be done since we clearly see that this isn't working? What's you the see the art corruption? The ad corruption unit of the president that has been instituted in state house is a pressure group. It's a pressure group. It's not constitutional. But uh, what I'm trying to tell you is that uh, we have systems that should be working. The IGG, the, the auditor general, the police. These are institutional systems that are supposed to work in a functional uh, 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 state lineup. But we are looking at them captured and they do not seem to have an authority. It's like you, Aliza, being, uh, being brought, brought in the ring to, to fight Mike Tyson, and the hands are, are, are tied from behind. They'll give you one punch and you die. We are talking about state captivity here. You get? And uh, for me, for us to fight corruption, I think it's going to require a lot of citizen engagement, just like I mentioned, to give corruption a face. And somebody knows that if I lack food, because the partial development model has not worked, then it's corruption, right? If my son or father or mother dies in Mulago because of lack of access to health services, it is corruption. Unfortunately, uh, Ugandans have institutionalized corruption that even when they go, they go to hospitals like Mulago, before they even, as long as they access hospitals, they have already organized money to give to these health workers, to corrupt them, to give them a service. Yet a service is supposed to be free. So let us take back the fight to the citizenry. But also, I call upon the president. I know he watches these, these shows, uh, all his aides work. Let him act. 
you Ugandans are annoyed. We are, we are feeling so bad that the good president, the wise president we know, is not coming up to act to stop these thieves that are killing Ugandans. You know, some of us know these things because we read. The one each do not know because they do not read. They don't have access to information. One of the things the mafias have done is to block access to information to the citizens to, end, to make to, to, for them to think that everything is okay when everything is not okay. I can run out of words talking about all the citizens. I want to hand over the mic back to you, Lisa. Thank you for engaging me in this discussion. I sign out. Thank you so much, Eddie. Thank you so much for that. So, Priska, in a few seconds, just give us your parting shots and the way forward in this fight. Listen, listening to Edward remarks, it's, it's like he, it's an indictment to us as journalists, where, especially when he points out that we should give corruption a face, because all we do is to, to throw these figures in front of the citizenry. So I'm, I'm, I'm citing a case where the, the, the National Integrity Survey that was done by the IG's office in 2019 indicated that we lose about 20 trillion shillings annually to corruption-related vices. So we, we simply throw away the 20 trillion. But imagine if we were to break down this 20 trillion and we say this 20 trillion can pay this number of doctors or can construct this num kilometers of roads. I think us as the informers, we have fallen short of of our services, the services that we are rendering. Go, going forward, I think I would, I would try to do better and give corruption a, a face, not leave it throw, throw fingers to the public as has been the case. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much, Priska. And Henry, finally, kindly give us your parting shots. Thank you very much, Lisa. I will give you three points. Number one, it does seem to me there is a sense in which these anti-corruption institutions were set up to be seen to be fighting corruption without actually actually doing anything about corruption. Number two, the citizens of Uganda have been hoodwinked for the longest time. Because if you look at the numbers that are allocated to local governments to deliver services, it's a mockery. Because you see, we've been told that local governments are the main vehicles of delivering services to the people. And then the budget that is allocated to deliver that service is only 10% of the local government budget. Are you kidding me? Number three, I think to the elected leaders and the people in power, one American scholar said, and I quote, he said that all politics is local. He also said that the success of any political system would depend on responding to local needs. For the longest time, the budget allocations have not uh, reflected that there is awareness of the government in, res of, 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 in terms of uh, responding to the needs of the citizenry. The citizenry, the ordinary person, feels betrayed, the policies that are being done at the national level do not resonate with the needs of the citizenry, I think the government, the people in power, need to reflect and change. I thank you very much. Back yes, to Lisa. thank you. Thank you so much, Henry. And thank you so much, our panelists. It's been a very interesting conversation. And thank you to all the viewers that tuned in. Don't forget to tune in next Wednesday, same place, same time. God bless you.